How are you all this evening? You happy to be here? Some people might get the impression that uh, I'm a little bit hard on my church. You're not getting that impression? You know, there are people who have nothing better to do than to sit on some holy hill and criticize this church. Please don't think that that's what I'm doing. I love this church. This is my church. And this is a prophetic movement. And the greatest sign that we have that we are in the very last moments of this earth's history is exactly this church. Because we are repeating the history of the children of Israel. And by following the journey, we can see where we are. Our feet are almost touching the Jordan. And if we see bad things happening in the church, don't think everyone in the church is bad. People ask me, are there Jesuits in the church? I think we would be naive to say there aren't Jesuits in the church. Of course there are Jesuits in the church. Am I going to look for them? No. I'm not a firefighter, I'm in the construction business. <laughs> Aren't we be repair, to be repairers of the breach and to build walls and to raise up the foundations that had been lost, the trampling of the character of Jesus, because no other foundation can be laid other than Christ Jesus, isn't that right? And our duty is to raise up that foundation to put him back where he should be. And when I speak about things like I spoke about last night, and I say sometimes, uh, 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 you know, with a twerky voice, that these things cannot possibly glorify Christ, but are sidetracks to take you away from a personal relationship with someone who loves you, then that doesn't mean that I'm attacking my church. I am speaking about particular rituals and mechanisms and means. There's no ritual that I can perform to make my, life, my wife love me. Is there a ritual that I can perform? Perhaps a peacock dance or <laughs> something like that to say, then she's really impressed with me? No. No. Love is about a relationship. We serve such a beautiful God, and when that relationship is trampled in the dust and changed into a ritual, it makes me sad. But, and this is a big but, I dare not judge anyone in this church. If I had to sell, set myself up as judge in this church to say who is an apostate and who is not an apostate, we would have a catastrophe because I'm a human being and I would make mistakes. Oh, I can see when someone does something that is apostate. But I dare not say the one who is doing it is an apostate. No matter how bad it is. If I had a choice today to choose between Caiaphas and Aaron as general conference president, my vote would absolutely go to Caiaphas. 
He stands for his church. Nothing is allowed to get in the way of the church. He keeps the Sabbath meticulously. He's a health reformer. Pooh, he strains a gnat. He's a vegan of vegans. When it comes to his leadership potentials, I cannot find fault with him. And his opponent in the other corner is Aaron. He makes a golden calf. He says, I threw this stuff in there and this calf came out. He's a liar. <laughs> Didn't he say that? Yeah, he's a liar. This calf came out. And the people were dancing and uh, what is the sound that I'm hearing over there? It's, it's the sound of war. No, my Lord, it is, it is the sound of music. They're singing. What? Is that a rock concert he's holding? Has he got the heavy metal band out? Good grief. <laughs> Would I choose him? No. No, he wouldn't get my vote. I would vote to kill the Son of God. I would vote to kill the Son of God based on my judgment. And by the way, am I a murderer? Yes, I am. I killed the Son of God because he died for me. Didn't he die for me? So who am I to judge? Who am I to judge? Does that mean we may not expose error in the church? Yes, we must. We are watchmen on the walls of Zion. But it is not for me to judge who is going to make a decision for Christ and who is not going to make a decision for Christ. It is not for me to judge Anybody in a position of leadership, no matter how apostate what he or she does seems to me. Because I don't know, is it Aaron or is it Caiaphas? I don't know. I don't know. So leave the judgment to God. But what I can do is I can weep between the porch and the altar and I can pray and I can intercede with God and plead with God. I can do those things and not set myself on a high horse because while I'm doing it, I'm standing on two banana peels with water under both of them. Be careful lest you think you stand and then you fall. So please see these lectures in that perspective and not as judgmental. They're not judgmental. I want to speak about this church and why it fulfills prophecy and why I shouldn't separate and go and sit on some, as I always say, holy hill, saying, look of them, or... God forbid, they've become part of Babylon. Our attitude must always be the attitude of Moses, which was, blot me from the book of life, but let them live. That must be our attitude. 1844 in type and anti-type. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We all need a transformation of character which can only be done through and in Christ so that we may develop discernment. The day that changed the world, October 22, 1844, It was not September 11, 2001. 
It did bring some changes in your banking system and your relationships with other nations, but it didn't change the world. But 1844 changed the world. This is the day that led to a new understanding and opened the floodgates of heaven to prophetic and doctrinal insight. It is the day that ushered in the hour of his judgment and placed Mordecai in the gate. I'm considering whether to give a lecture titled Mordecai in the gate. It was the day for the restoration of the old waste places, the restoration of paths to dwell in. Five great principles, Bible-based principles, were discovered and presented to the world while Satan worked furiously to destroy their impact. The way was present, prepared by both the powers in the conflict, the one to spread this message universally and the other to counteract its acceptance. This was a momentous day. So let's look at it. <coughs> It was a leap year. <laughs> and it was a leap year, I believe, in more ways than one. After the great disappointment between April and September 1848, a series of meetings were held known as Sabbath conferences. And there the five pillars of Adventism were established. And not one of these pillars may be moved. Not one. The sanctuary doctrine. Have there been attacks on the sanctuary doctrine? Whew. The doctrine of the second advent. Don't spiritualize it away. The doctrine on the Sabbath. The doctrine on the state of the dead. And the spirit of prophecy. Those are the pillars of Adventism. And out of these, finally emerged the whole gamut of what it entails to preach the three angels' messages. That is the final call to mankind. So the great plan of redemption as revealed in the closing work of these last days should receive close examination. The scenes connected with the sanctuary above should make such an impression upon the mind and the hearts of all that they may be able to impress others. I recall the day when I was talking. I was so excited when I discovered all these things and we had a guest over. and It was an, an Anglican man, an Anglican pastor. And I was talking about what I discovered about the sanctuary and all of a sudden he got up and he was furious. I thought, what have I done now? And he said, you're trying to ridicule me in front of my wife that I don't know these things. I said, please, that wasn't my intention. I'm just bubbling over with what I have discovered. Come and discover it with me, but he didn't want to. All need to become intelligent in regard to the work of the atonement which is going on in the sanctuary above. When this grand truth is seen and understood, those who hold it, will work in harmony with Christ to prepare a people to stand in the great day of God and their efforts will be successful. I'm reading from the Spirit of Prophecy. By study, contemplation and prayer, God's people will be elevated above common, earthly thoughts and feelings and will be brought into harmony with Christ and His great work of cleansing the sanctuary above from the sins of the people. Their faith will go with Him into the sanctuary and the worshippers on earth will be carefully reviewing their lives and comparing their characters with the great standard of righteousness. That's the job we have to do. They will see their own defects. They will also see that they must have the aid of the Spirit of God if they would become qualified for the great and solemn work for this time which is laid upon God's ambassadors. This is an important statement. So the first angel's message, Revelation 14, this comes from great controversy, announcing the hour of his judgment and calling upon men to fear and worship him, was designed to separate the professed people of God from the corrupting influences of the world. So there was a calling out. 
Typologically, when was there a calling out? Egypt. They were called out of Egypt to go to Canaan. In this message, God has sent to the church a warning which, it, which had it been accepted, would have corrected the evils that were shutting them away from him. All right. So the final reformation was to commence in 1844. Now, I'm not going to go into the prophetic study of the 2,300 days and show that 1844 is a biblical date confirmed by archaeology because the starting point of this prophecy has been found in stone. If Francois was here, he would tell you. In 1844, the Seventh-day Baptist, Rachel Oakes, challenged the Millerite preacher, Frederick Wheeler, to keep all the commandments of God. So this doctrine, which was established as a pillar of this church, was first introduced on what date? 1844. And then he preached his first sermon on the Sabbath in March 1844. 44. Charles Fitch wrote in 1844 that he had accepted the biblical teaching of the conditional immortality of the soul. The doctrine came in 1844. 1844 saw the awakening of the spirit of prophecy and the visions of William Foy, Hazen Foss and Ellen Harmon received her first vision December 1844. She was 17 years old. She was a child. Then the means to broadcast the message worldwide, May 24, 1844, Samuel Morse, he was a conspiratist. Sent his, he was. <laughs> Sent his first message over the wires from the U.S. Capitol in Washington, D.C. to the B&O Railroad. And... Uh, the message, the first one to go over the wire was what God has wrought. Isn't that fascinating? <laughs> yeah, he was the one who warned his countrymen of the great Jesuit conspiracy to overthrow the liberties of Protestant freemen secured by the Constitution. Do you think that's coincidental? <laughs> I have found out that nothing is coincidental in this world. March 12, 1844, the Columbus and Zinnia Railroad, first railroad that is planned to be built in Ohio, is chartered. And from this beginning, the whole gamut of telecommunication and communication developed so that the message could go worldwide. Isaiah 30, verse 21, And thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way, walk ye in it, when ye turn to the right hand and when you turn to the left. God will give the world a direction. He will do it. And then, archaeology. I always am so fascinated how these two dates always pop up. 1798. Napoleon Bonaparte authorized an expedition to seize Malta and Egypt. Of this expedition, Merrill Unger writes, Modern archaeology may be said to have had its beginning in 1798. And then the Danish scholar Niels Ludwig Westergaard deciphered the Elamite cuneiform in 1844. So the book of Daniel gets its power. Fascinating stuff. The prophecies come up. So besides Millerism and Adventism, 1844 saw the birth of Baha'ism. The whole world will come together under one umbrella in order all the religions will join together. The highest representation of all religions in the United Nations is the Baha'i sector, although I think there are others uh, connected to it, of course. Communism, 1844. That's when Karl Marx started out. Darwinism, Mormonism, Spiritism, Dispensationalism, 
existentialism, Quakerism, Millerism, Seventh-day Adventism, all of them, 1844. And then in addition, the Sinaiticus manuscript was discovered and the Vaticanus was rediscovered, 1844. And Ecumenism was born in 1844. And what is the word oikomena means? It means the whole inhabited world. All of them 1844. 1821, James Haldane Stewart promotes ecumenism and prayer for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So the preparation takes place. William Miller also started preaching before 1844. Then they have Union for Prayer, Edwin Irvin, founder of the Catholic Apostolic Church, still a Presbyterian then. And then the first organization ever formed that is ecumenical across all denominations is the YMCA, formed in 1844. You must go and check out in Jerusalem how big the building on the YMCA is there. And from that humble beginning, we go onwards to the National Council of Churches in Christ, then the Evangelical Alliance of London in 1846, and all of these things. Christians from ten countries met in London in 1846, but the first move was 1844, and then it started coming across the world. And the different churches. 1846, Evangelical Alliance founded a founding meeting in the Freemason Hall in London. In 1843, a meeting in Scotland commemorating the 200th anniversary of the Westminster Assembly. That's where the Protestant creed was developed. Issued a plea for closer unity. The same year, Presbyterian William Patton of New York wrote the British to British Congregationalist John Angle James recommending an inter-church conference. And the whole planning of this took place in 1844 and 1845 and then came to fruition in 1846. Fascinating stuff. Let's look at the Exodus in type and anti-type. Patriarchs and Prophets. The history of the wilderness life of Israel was chronicled for the benefit of the Israel of God to the close of time. Let's get the parallels. The record of God's dealing with the wanderers of the desert in all their marchings to and fro in the exposure to hunger, thirst, weariness, and the striking manifestations of His power for their relief is fraught with warning and instruction for his people in all ages. The varied experience of the Hebrews was a school of preparation for the promised home in Canaan. Are we in a school now? I think so. God would have his people in these days review with humble heart and teachable spirit the trials through which ancient Israel passed, that they may be instructed in their preparation for the heavenly Canaan. So when the children of Israel were taken out of Egypt, they experienced all these miracles, the plagues that fell, the Red Sea that parted, the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire behind them, Pharaoh's army destroyed all of those wondrous things. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea and they went out into the wilderness of Shur and there went three days in the wilderness and found no water. They had all these marvelous experiences and they found no water. And when they came to Mara, and what does Mara mean? Bitter. They could not drink of the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Mara. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. 
which when he had cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. Are you getting parallel sounds in your head? Bitter, sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. This is Mara. So this is where they came. And here are the wells. And uh, the water was bitter. But to this day, the water there is sweet. Had Adventists, after the great disappointment in 1844, held fast their faith and followed on unitedly in the opening providence of God, receiving the message of the third angel and in the power of the Holy Spirit proclaiming it to the world, the Lord would have wrought mightily with their efforts, the work would have been completed, and Christ would have come ere this to receive his people to their reward. So, 1844... There was this great expectation, this great excitement, this great mega movement. All the people came together, and then there was a bitter disappointment. But in the period of doubt and uncertainty that followed the disappointment, many of the Advent believers yielded their faith. Thus the work was hindered, and the world was left in darkness. For 40 years did unbelief, murmuring, and rebellion shut out ancient Israel from the land of Canaan. The same sins, please note, have delayed the entrance of modern Israel into the heavenly Canaan. In neither case were the promises of God at fault. It is the unbelief, the worldliness, the unconsecration and strife amongst Lord, the Lord's professed people that have kept us in this world of sin and sorrow so many years. So here's the parallel. We are the antitype of what happened there. Charge it not to God. We may have to remain here in this world because of insubordination many more years, as did the children of Israel. But for Christ's sake, his people should not add sin to sin by charging God with the consequence of their own wrong course of action. We may hasten the day by giving the gospel to the world. It is in our power to hasten our Lord's return. We have a job to do. Second Timothy. Chapter 2, study to show thyselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. This is the state in which the world is in. Their words will eat as it doth a canker of whom is, and then he mentions all these people who concerning the truth have heard saying the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. And so he goes on to say, there are some vessels that are for good and some are for bad, but we must all work together. In other words, a good character, we read in the spirit of prophecy, must be built up brick by brick. And this is the school. We're in the school. Those characteristics which will enable the youth to labor successfully in God's cause must be obtained by the diligent exercise of their faculties, by improving every advantage and providence will give wisdom in order to achieve this. And Jesus would have all who profess his name become earnest workers. It is necessary that every individual member build upon the rock, Christ Jesus. Build with tears, with prayer, every one of us. Why do we not work together? Why is there such fragmentation in this church? Jeremiah said, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. The Lord, our 
righteousness. Now I'm not going to do here the lecture on 1888 when this church and the people of the world following the message could have entered into Canaan. But because of unbelief, they refused to go in. The spies went in, and how many came back and said, it is a goodly land, we are well able to take it? How many came back? Two. 1888. How many said, we can, with the righteousness of Christ? How many were there? Two. And because of unbelief, we didn't go in. The parallels are just fantastic. They're fabulous. I've got a whole lecture on all those little details of what happened in 1888. We are the absolute mirror image. Except that we have perfected it. We are better than they. <laughs> Therefore, behold, the days come, says the Lord, that they shall no more say, The Lord liveth, which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Lord liveth, which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country. So there are two calls. The one was for the children of Israel out of Egypt, but the day is coming sometime in the future in this text when not just the children of Israel out of Egypt, that was just a type. When they come out of the north country, that's the call out of what? Out of Babylon. Who's going to give that call? We. We're the only ones who have that message. There's no other church that has that message. That's our job. And when the children of Israel failed, God said, listen Joshua, listen Cable, Caleb and Moses and uh, you Levites that didn't apostatize, come, I'll take you into the kingdom and we'll chuck these others out. Did he do that? No. They all turned back. All of them turned back. And they didn't separate themselves. And Caleb and Joshua and Moses say, well, let's build a holy temple over there and call ourselves the Reformers. And we'll leave this Babylonian confusion behind us. No. They kept being identified with the people of God. Isn't that right? And so it is with us. So there will be a second message. So the delivery from Egypt's bondage was the greatest event in the history of Israel. And this deliverance prefigured a greater deliverance of God's people in the final gathering of the anti-typical Israel. Does that make sense? Isaiah says, and in that day there shall be a root of Jesse which shall stand for an enzyme of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. Who could bring that message? Israel couldn't bring it. They didn't even know who the root of Jesse was, and when he came they rejected him. So it has to be a future generation. It's you and me. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again. A what? A second time to recover the remnant of his people which shall be left. And now not just out of Egypt, out of Assyria, from Egypt, from Pater, from Cush, from Elam, from Shina, from Hamad, da, 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 the islands of the sea. What was local becomes universal. So there must be a people of destiny who actually proclaim this message. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations. Will they have a banner, a sign, a mark? This final people, yes or no? Yes, it will be the same mark and sign that they kept. You, Moses, make the people Shabbat, get ye to your burdens. The Sabbath will be prominent again. So it had to be that a people would come and relive as antitype what Israel went through. 
Corinthians says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you be ignorant how that all of our fathers were under the cloud and passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses. And they eat they ate the same spiritual meat and they drank the spiritual drink and that was Christ. So the manna represented Jesus Christ the bread of life that must be internalized and the wine represented the blood of Christ. So this had to receive a greater fulfillment in the final gathering but then it warns neither be ye idolaters as were some of them. So will we have idolatry in the church? If they had it, and we're the antitype, we must have it. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. That's fascinating. Eating and drinking was very prominent, and playing. What was this playing? It was sport. They had sport. Sport. And in the Gilgamesh epic, if you knock a ball into a hole with a stick. We don't have games like that, eh? Knocking balls into holes with sticks. Or kick the ball into a net. That was the victory of the sun god over his enemies. And that's an act of worship. Neither be fornicators as some of them. Neither tempt Christ. Neither murmur as some of them murmured and were destroyed. Now all these things happened as an example. We're going to do all those things. In other words, if all of these things are not in the church, find yourself one where it's present. So if you think that it's here, and therefore I have to become a Reform Adventist, where these things are not present, sorry, you've separated yourself from this. Come back. Come back. What are you doing? I was, I was lecturing in Germany and the Reform Ad Adventists were angry with me and they said, but it stinks within the church. I said, it stank in the ark too. <laughs> there was plenty of manure in the ark, but if you jumped outside the ark, you drowned. <laughs> yes, but we can't stand the stench. I said, buy yourself a clothes peg. Come back into the ark. What are you doing outside? This is God's people. This is his church. Irrespective of what it looks like, we are repeating their history. We have the same disobedience, the same objectionable features. So when I gave that lecture tonight and I said, we have the same objectionable features, I wasn't knocking my church. I was just saying we fulfill prophecy. I have been shown, who says that? Spirit of prophecy. That the spirit of the world is fast leavening the church. You are following the same path as did ancient Israel. There is the same falling away from your holy calling of God's peculiar people. You are having fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Your concord with unbelievers has provoked the Lord's displeasure. They did amazing things. I'll, I'll still give some lectures. But please don't see them as criticism, but as fulfillment of prophecy. And don't judge who is Caiaphas and who is Aaron. You know not the things that belong to your peace, and they are fast being hid from your eyes. Your neglect to follow the light will place you in a more unfavorable position than the Jews upon whom Christ pronounced a woe. We are in bigger trouble than they were. Much bigger trouble. The sin of ancient Israel was in disregarding the expressed will of God in following their own way according to the leadings of unsanctified hearts. Modern Israel are fast following in their footsteps. And the displeasure of the Lord is as surely resting upon them. Why don't we see mega miracles and wonders and signs within our church? We are under divine rebuke. Israel was under divine rebuke 
when they went back into the wilderness to march there for 40 years, they were not circumcised in those 40 years, which stands for circumcision of the heart, and they were not allowed to partake in the, in the Passover meal. For 40 years. And only when they had crossed the Jordan, before they took Jericho, did Joshua circumcise the people and they kept the Passover. We're under a divine rebuke. We've got nothing to, to boast with. We have nothing to show the world. We can't, like Benny Hinn, see, see all these people lying over here, walking in with their crutches and walking out with their crutches. Uh, I think I must have got that wrong somehow. <laughs> the same disobedience and failure which were seen in the Jewish church have characterized, in a what? What does it say there? In a greater degree, the people who've had this great light from heaven in the last message of warning. Shall we, like them, squander our opportunities and privileges? And shall God shall permit oppression and persecution to come upon us? Will the work which might be performed in peace and comparative pro prosperity be left undone until it must be performed in the days of darkness under the pressure of trial and persecution? We're worse. So there are fascinating parallels between the two. I dare not leave this movement. I'm part of this movement and you are part of this movement. And when you see evil things and apostasy and all these terrible things happening within the church, weep. Don't run. Don't run. The Exodus movement was based on a definite time prophecy, wasn't it? There it is, Genesis 15, 13. And he said unto Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And afterwards they shall come out with great substance. Exodus 12, 40. Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. It took 30 years longer. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even in the selfsame day, it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. So Israel didn't leave Egypt till 30 years after the 400 had expired. And the Advent movement proper also started about 30 years after the close of the 1260-day prophecy. Same thing. Oh, the parallels are so fantastic. Revelation 11:2. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city, that they shall tread underfoot forty and two months. There's the 1,260-day prophecy, and I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth, the dark ages. And then light was to come, and prophetically, gong, here they come. Here comes the message, perfect fulfillment. And I heard one saint speaking to another saint, and he said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision? And you know it, about uh, 2,300 days. Why so long? But in the fourth generation they shall come hither, was the promise in the book of Genesis, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So that was the reason why it took so long in the type. So in the antitype, the reason must be exactly the same. So this final call out of Babylon continues until the cup of iniquity is filled for the world, as it was to be filled for the Canaanite nations. Does that make typological sense? Children of God, I'm trying to confirm you in this movement, 
This is not just some church that you can join or leave at a whim. This church is a, on a movement. It's the great Advent movement, isn't it? And it's in the desert. And if you want to go it alone, you will die. If you don't have the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire, you are going to die. Do we have people who want to return to the flesh pots of Egypt amongst us? Yes or no? Of course. Do I sometimes want to return to the things that I shouldn't want to return to? Of course. And therefore I need divine intervention in my life and I need a bonx on the bean ever so often. Uh, the Lord makes sure you get it. With unerring accuracy, the infinite one still kept an account with all the nations. While his mercy is tendered, with calls to repentance, this account will remain open. But when the figures reach a certain amount which God has fixed, the ministry of his wrath commences. The account is closed, divine patience ceases, there is no more pleading of mercy in their behalf. We know when it will happen, when they will make God's authority null and void and kick him out of all legislators in, on this planet. Then it will be full. The crisis is fast approaching. The time for God's visitation has about come. Although loath to punish, nevertheless he will punish, and that speedily. So we need to pray. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous veil, veileth must. Time will last a little longer until the inhabitants of the earth have filled up the cup of their iniquity and then the wrath of God which has so long slumbered will awake and this land of light will drink the cup of his unmingled wrath. The cup of iniquity is nearly filled and the retributive justice of God is about to descend upon the guilty. It's going to come. It's not far off. And as I said, we will see that not only did we follow the exodus not only through unbelief did we return from the borders of Canaan in 1888 and went back into the wilderness we will see that we parallel the second return that we refused the righteousness by faith and that we had to go around Edom so that we can look and live. And we will even parallel Baal Peor. And then you cross a, across the Jordan. Now we've done Baal Peor. We're good at it. We're at the border. It's fascinating. So as in the days of Exodus, the Sabbath will be prominent in the antitype. It has to be. Let's quickly look at those verses. Blessed is the man that doeth this, and the son of man that layeth hold on it, says Isaiah 56, that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and keeping his hand from doing any evil. So even the stranger that joins himself to the Lord will not be a dry tree. And what will that stranger do? He will keep the Sabbath. For thus says the Lord unto the eunuch, that keep my Sabbath and choose the things that please me and take hold of my covenant. Even unto them will I give in my house a position greater than sons and daughters. So God's going to call people into the movement, but the Sabbath will be very prominent. So in both movements, God does not only call the faithful, but he brings all all classes into his ranks. Isn't that right? So that they may learn from him in the wilderness experience. The rebels and the unfaithful ones are then purged from his people. And when David was in the wilderness, hiding away from Saul and his mighty men were called, and the Bible gives such beautiful descriptions of how they fight with Egypt and how one of the mighty men wrestles the weaver's beam-sized spear from the Egyptian and 
kills the Egyptian. That's a typology for us. If I don't wrestle the spear from the Egyptian inside of me and kill him, he's going to kill me. I must get rid of that which is in me, which was in the Israelites of old. That hungering of the Babylon. Ezekiel 20, 38, And I will purge out from among you the rebels and them that transgress against me. I will bring them forth out of the country where they sojourn and they will not enter into the land of Israel and you shall know that I am the Lord. So is there a coming out or a spitting out here? Is a spitting out. It will be the same in the end. Because they are lukewarm, I will spew them out of my mouth. I cannot decide I'm going to leave this church. It's apostate. Don't do that. You'll be walking out. You're spitting yourself out. Stay. Suffer. He chose to suffer with the children of God rather than to be called Pharaoh's or Pharaoh's daughter's son or whatever. So the exodus out of Egypt implies a former ingress into Egypt. This took place when Jacob moved to Egypt because of famine and the religion of Israel became contaminated with heathen practices and so called God called them out. If you look at sun worship, Amon-Ra, Pharaoh means Fa-Ra, the sun. And say unto them, Thus says the Lord God in the day when I chose Israel and lifted up mine hand unto the seed of the house of Egypt, Jacob and made myself known unto them in the land of Egypt. Then I lifted up mine hand unto them, saying, I am the Lord your God. In that day that I lifted up mine hand unto them to bring them forth out of the land of Egypt into the land that I had espied for them flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all the lands. Then said I unto them, Cast ye away, every man, the abominations of your eyes. Get rid of what's wrong, and defile not yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. But they hungered after Egypt constantly. They rebelled against me, Ezekiel says, and would not hearken unto me. They did not every man cast away the abominations of their eyes, neither did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Will we have the idols of Egypt in our ranks, yes or no? Yes. Is that a reason to leave? No. Then I said, I will pour out my fury upon them to accomplish my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. But I wrought for my name's sake that I should not be polluted before the heathen amongst whom they were, and in whose sight I made myself known unto them to bring them forth out of Egypt. Uh, wherefore I caused them to go forth out of the land of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness. We're not perfect. We're pathetic. So in both movements, God calls out a people and brings them into the wilderness that they can keep his law, not because they are pathetic, I mean, not because they're perfect, but because they're pathetic. So, that's me. I'm pathetic. If you don't believe me, ask my wife. <laughs> Psalm 105, and he brought forth his people with joy. Why? So that they could observe his statutes and keep his laws. That's it. You know, there are people who believe that they embrace the Sabbath and they embrace the health message and they embrace all of this, now they're saved. Nobody is saved by their right understanding of any doctrine. Nobody is saved by changing one set of theology for another set of theology. Nobody is saved by changing one lifestyle for another lifestyle. There's no such thing as salvation by theology. Neither is there such a thing as salvation by diet. It doesn't exist. There's only salvation by grace. The wilderness is for cleansing. 
A mixed multitude accompanied Israel on their journey and many lusted after the flesh pots of Egypt. And we are the mixed multitude. Look where I come from. Am I a perfect, genetically bred Israelite? I'm a mixed multitude. Does it say a mixed minority? Does it? Nope. It says a mixed multitude. And they were the troublemakers. So will the bulk of us be perfect or the bulk of us be pathetic? Pathetic. And they lusted after Egypt. To whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them, and their hearts turned back again into Egypt. By the way, did they go back to Egypt, or did their hearts go back to Egypt? Their hearts went back to Egypt. They didn't say, I'm out of here. And off they went back to Egypt. They stayed with the children of Israel, but their hearts were in Egypt. And we have the same problem. Saying unto Aaron, make us gods. We don't have to go into this. You know all of this. And then God turned and gave them up to the worship of the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of prophets. And they went back to the wilderness. So this Advent movement of Daniel 8 and 9, God's people are called from bondage to Babylon and Egypt. And there's a distinct time prophecy heralding the Exodus. Is that right? For 1,260 years, the people of God would be afflicted. 2,300-day prophecy heralded the second Advent movement. The Advent message goes out some years before 1844 with the preachings of William Miller. And the time is fulfilled in 1844, and this parallels the entire movement. And it will carry on until the iniquity of the Amorites is full. Then we go home. Look at the news. Do you think the iniquity is filling up, yes or no? I think so. Now, when we look at the Exodus, we've already discussed this, so I'm just going to breeze through it. Pharaoh is the one who made the decree. The Lord said unto Moses, Go unto Pharaoh, tell him, Let my people go, that they can serve me. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven to you, and the people will go out and gather it a certain Right every day I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. This is about God's law. Did you know that Egypt worshipped the dragon? Ezekiel 29 verse 3, Speak and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon that lieth in the midst of his river which has said, my river is mine own, and I've made it for myself. What a fascinating text. This religious system is a religion of self-esteem. <laughs> we hear that. The antitype also worships the dragon, and they worship the dragon. Revelation 13, 4, which gave power unto the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war against him? All these beautiful parallels in the Bible. We're supposed to be a separate people. And the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the porters, the singers, the Nethanims, and all they that had separated themselves... We don't want to do that. We want to be part of the people. And when the children of Israel met all the other nations, the Moabites and the <laughs> Midianites, and, and the girls had such nice little dresses on, <laughs> did they succumb to them, yes or no? By the way, the Moabites and the Midianites, were they sister churches? Were they sister churches? Weren't they descendants of Abraham? Or of the family of Abraham? Yes, they were sister churches. We'll come to that. And the miniskirt is so short, you wonder whether it's a belt. <laughs> and we just love them. Can't leave them alone. It's hard to be separate. 
Come out from amongst them. Be separate. Touch not the unclean thing. Be not yoked together with unbelievers. These are important things. I'm almost through with the first half. Moses tried to introduce Sabbath reforms in Egypt, but it wasn't possible without separation. Not possible. You have to separate from that which holds you back. You cannot be on two sides at the same time. Exodus 5, verse 4 and 9, he says, Let the people from their works, wherefore do you, Moses and Aaron, let the people from their works? You're not allowed to do them. Get you to your burdens. He makes a law. And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land are many, and you make them Shabbat, keep the Sabbath, rest from their burdens. Don't give them any straw. Go to work. Makes this anti-Sabbath law, and off we go. So the Egyptians also counterfeited God's miracles. So the anti-typical priests and prelates will counterfeit the workings of God with lying wonders. They charmed the snakes. Can they still do that? Charm snakes? That they're stiff as a rod? Yes. Go to India and see how they do it. And then you throw the rod down and becomes a snake. So they were counterfeiters of the highest order. But there will be a final gathering. And I think with that note, we will end the first session. And I gather there's a special item, so don't move. Thank you. You're not the special item? I'm like Francois, I'd run them all out. <laughs> As our special music is coming forward, they need to come forward now. We found a cell phone out in a parking lot. It's been buzzing in my hand over here. I should have answered it. If you've been missing a cell phone, let me know I've got it in my pocket. In Revelations chapter 4, verse 11, we read, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. And that's what we're going to be singing about tonight. Yeah. Mm -hmm.